Great. And um, okay. So I am sitting here with the divine Charlotte Dam. Is it also, oh my God, I didn't ask this off camera, but I'm going to ask yeah. it on camera. It's Damboise. Did I say it right? Perfect. You said it so perfectly. You could have said Damboise. But you said Damboise. Well, it was going to either be Damboise or Boise, <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't sure, but Bois was like, yes. the, yeah. Yeah, with the S at the end, because it's French. And when you have an E at the end of an S, it's pronounced with the S. Damboise. Damboise, yes. I, was, I, I almost went into panic mode, and I was going to be like, I'm sitting here with Charlotte D of Broadway <laughs> fame. <laughs> That's um, good. So I, I interv I've interviewed a lot of uh, Broadway stars on here who tell me that they have no connection to the business at all from their family, that they were the only person in their family who had any inclination towards theater. And I always thought that was bizarre because I'm not like that. And I like, I, like you, come from a lineage of, of, of performers. And you, of course, are the daughter of Jacques D'Amboise, who's often considered to be one of, one of the all-time great dancers of our time. So my first question is, what did you learn from your father about dancing? And did you learn it by watching him or did you learn it by him telling you in words about dancing? Um, I, I think initially when I was a kid, I, it was watching, watching him, watching him perform and watching his uh, dedication to the art of performance. So what it took for him every night to get on stage as a dancer. You know, it was hard work. And then also watching him perform. And um, I, I, I took from him because he was a man. And to see a male dancer, I was obsessed with, with I, I didn't like the women dancers. I liked the male dancers because they seemed to jump and turn and do much more interesting stuff than, this is in ballet, mind you, ballet. So I was exposed only, mostly in the ballet world, which is very different than the Broadway world. And especially nowadays, things mix more in Broadway. Uh, a lot of ballet stars do some Broadway and there's a little bit more mix. But in my time, there was no mix. It was really just ballet. And Broadway was a whole nother thing. But um, I just got that masculinity thing from my dad. And I realized that, you know, I wanted to be powerful as a dancer, as opposed to what I felt like, even though now I feel differently about ballerinas, but I, I just wanted to be the one in charge, I think. And that was from watching my dad and, and just watching his work etiquette, you know, etiquette, that whole, the way he worked was huge. Um, yeah, does what that were, make sense? Totally. What, what were the positive things that came out of being from a lineage of a, an amazing dancer besides the obvious things like you learned how to dance by watching. I mean, what, what were some other great things that you felt like you got out of being related to somebody like that? Well, the thing is, is that my dad was, is not like a normal guy. You know, he was always giving, you know, I mean, as a person, he's a person that uh, is a teacher and, and even though he didn't teach me, but he was always giving to students and, and people always. And that's what I got from him. Like, I always feel like I need to, give to people that need. So I'm always trying to, you know, teach and give money. And he started the National Dance Institute and all that stuff. So he was, he was just always that person. It was just more than just a dancer. Also, he wasn't that famous. So he was just famous enough. So only people came up to him like res with respect as opposed to just fame. And what I got from that was like, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to just be famous to be famous. I want to be famous to be respected. Mm -hmm. I want to be famous for what I do and, and that I'm good at it. And that I, I have talent. I heard, a difference. I heard Liza Minnelli once say in an interview, this was in the 80s, she said it was really difficult to grow up the daughter of Judy Garland because it got her, being Judy Garland's daughter got her in the door but then she had to prove herself twice as hard once they knew she was yes. Judy Garland's daughter. Yes, and I, I actually feel that way with my dad, even though I have to say the Broadway world was very different. Uh, it was very separate. 
I can't, it just really was. So, but I did have to, because people expect it. You walk in and you're Jacques Dubois' daughter, then you better, oh, she's going to be an amazing dancer. You know what I mean? Oh, she's got to be amazing because she's Jacques' daughter. And then if you're not that, and you know what I mean? And more than the five people, the 10 people that went in before you, then you're like, oh, well, she's not. And so you have to, you absolutely have to. I totally, totally agree with her on that. And it does get you in the door and it gets you looked at, noticed. Like they remember you. Oh, that's Jacques Stoner. You, you, you are a, a two-time Tony-nominated actress also. Did you ever get, and I will say, having seen you perform, you really, I'm not just saying this because you're on here. I, I don't lie to the guests. You, you really are a good, good actress. D did you ever get pigeonholed earlier in your career as somebody who's yes. a dancer? Yes, and I still do. It's a constant, it's a constant, constant battle. But I knew at a very early age, I, first of all, I always loved acting more than anything, even in some ways more than dance. I was just naturally good at dance, but acting was, I, I, I wasn't naturally good at, and I just was obsessed with it. So I studied very early on and was attracted to that. And I also knew that that was what was going to take me to the next level. So I knew I wouldn't get acting more than the chorus unless I could be a really good actress and out act every dancer. So I really worked on that. It was not something that came, you know what I mean? I knew I had it all in me. Like I had all of the, I could, emotion in there. I just needed to, you know, have confidence in it. So I really worked at that. Thank you for saying that. Even though, you know. It's true. But Lisa, Lisa Gaida, who is one of our co-anchors on this podcast, said something about when I said she, I was interviewing Charlotte, she said, Charlotte always finds the truth in the moment when she dances. And I, having watched you on stage, I thought that was a really articulate and beautiful way of describing the way that you dance. And I think that that speaks to your work as an actress, that even you think being an actor on stage, what you want to look for is somebody who's just honest and somebody who really cuts to the core of the scene. I think that as a dancer on stage, there is a truthfulness to the way that you dance. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're that welcome. Means a lot. It's true. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just saying, I have, I always say this to the guests. I don't like, I, I'm not going to make shit up on here. Like I, I don't like a, a lot of hosts do that. Yeah. And I, I, I don't have the capacity. I'm Irish. Um, it's just going to all come out one way or the other. So um, yeah. I, I was talking about uh, years ago, I was talking to Deidre Goodwin, who was, who played mm -hmm. Sheila in your course on revival and was just mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful in that show. And she's wonderful in everything she does. And I remember I said to her, Oh, chorus line, you know, that must've been a really challenging show with all of the dancing. And she said, well, the, the dancing was sort of hard, but it was mostly harder to just stand there in one place all night. And I, I laughed and, and she said, no, I'm not kidding. She said it was harder to stand there than it was to actually dance. Is that true? Can you speak okay. to that? Well, first of all, I have to say Sheila, the role is the best role in the show. Yeah. There's no question about it because she gets to be funny. She doesn't have to dance that well. She gets to cut out on most of the dancing huh. and then she gets to be comical and funny the whole time. Cassie is hell to do because, and talk about standing on the line. You stand for an hour before you even start your dance. So your body is killing you from standing in one position before you have to sing your heart out, act your heart out, and dance your heart out. I, so watched, it, so I, I watched the, it's on, the whole show is on YouTube, and I watched, I was gonna watch your scene in preparation for this, and then I watched the entire production. Um, I realized you don't get a goddamn water break before that either. It's so cruel that you are on the stage, and then you just, Cassie, come back. It's like, really? Come back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really come back. And now you have at 9.15, I think it was like 9.15 at night, you had to dance and sing and act your heart out and not be funny. <laughs> right. I have to say, I love doing comedy because it's so much more fun to do in the long runs. When you have to be kind of the straight girl or the ingenue, it's hard. Because you actually, get bored quickly. It's you actually, to, now that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's the least funny scene in the American musical theater canon. They're, like, you don't get one real 
zinger no, in the that scene. Only, the only zinger is the thing about being a Band-Aid in a commercial, which is so not funny. <laughs> that's a, that's, even if Lucille Ball delivered that joke, it's yeah. like, you're gonna get a chuckle. That's not a, you know. Yeah, it's exactly. true though. Cass, and then she's gotta stand there all night and then you're about to walk off stage, possibly to get a sip of water. And he's like, Cassie? Come back. Come back. <laughs> no, please, just, God, just no. <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, so, you know, you were Tony nominated for the role of Cassie. I, I was thinking back to the original production from the 70s, and I don't think there was anyone in that production, while we know a lot of them, certainly, that was more closely linked to the role originally than Donna McKechnie was, as far right. as being most intricately linked to the character. Yeah. What was that like to, to, to get cast in this revival? It was the first time it had been revived. And yeah. now all of a sudden you, you're already a Tony nominated actress yourself and you have to do your own thing, but, still, do this, but still in the same costume and in the same- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same choreography. You know, it, it, it was tough because they didn't really allow any kind of changing of anything, unfortunately. Um, and if Michael Bennett were alive, he would have. Do you know what I mean? He would have completely worked it around me and, you know. So I was, I was stuck with that. Not, you know, not that Donna McKechnie's stuff isn't amazing, but it's really made for her. It really is made for her movement. And choreographed, um, and choreographed to her body specifically, I think. Exactly, exactly. Her, and her, uh, Yeah, her neck and yeah, like everything that she does. Her like, and her way to the floor and her move, uh, the whole thing. So um, it was tough. I mean, that was not easy. And, and that dance is very deceiving because it looks easier than it is. I mean, it, it's crazy exhausting. Within like five, you know, two minutes into it, you, you're huffing and puffing and you're like, why? Like when I look at it and I look at someone else do it, I'm like, why are they huffing? I don't get why it's so hard because it doesn't look it, but it really is. It's crazy exhausting. But, um, it, you know what, I, I've done a lot of those kind of things. I've, I've, done a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of replacements and I've also done a lot of iconic roles in replacing Gwen, I mean, in doing Damn Yankees with Gwen Verdon I, and, and um, Cheetah in Pippin, you know, and yeah. um, Roxy and all these roles were with iconic people and I've had to kind of make my own with it, you know, yeah. and... Um, I've, I've sort of learned how I've done it. I've, you have to kind of have confidence in, in you and what you're going to bring to it that's going to be a little different and know that that's going to be interesting. Yeah. And I, I always find that I know I can find something. I, what I do is I look at a role and I, I study it before I look at the them do it, if I can look at them do it. I find my own choices. And then after I've made my own choices, I go and I look at, their performance, if I can, Don McKechnie's, after I've made my own choices. And then I go, oh, that's good. Oh, how did I not see that? I'm taking that, I'm taking that. And then I'm keeping this, this, this. And then I form it, and then it becomes what it becomes. It's kind of and that's what sort we- of how I've, I've just noticed that's pretty much kind of how I've done it over the years. But I definitely want to find that thing before I look at the performance. Because if I, I look at the performance, I lose that. I lose that initial. You know, the, the unique spark, this, and the spark of uh, individuality. Guess, yeah, exactly. Um, what about Cassie? While doing the role, did you ever start to relate to uh, what I saw? I remember again to quote Deidre. I remember talking to her, and she was saying one of the hard things was not getting cast every night. Like Sheila gets cut from yeah. the show, and I was sort of like, "Well, it's a show." I was like, "It's just yeah. a show," but she was like, yeah. "She was like, no." It, it actually really hurt to get cut. And I, that really stuck with me. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because for the longest time people used to talk about, oh, I'm an actor and, and it really like affected me in my life and it, this and that. And I used to think, what do you mean it affected you in your life? Like you acted it and your life is that. And I, that's how I felt my whole life until I did that role. Now mind you, I did that role for two years. So it did sink into me in a deep way. And it, and it, the, every night having to get on stage and and beg for a job 
You know what I mean? I mean, as much as Zach was there and I, and I had my integrity, I'm still begging this man who I had an affair with for a job, for a job in the chorus, which is not a bad thing. I mean, she had, but it's just- It's demoralizing. It, was, it, it ends up after a year of doing that every night and, and you're auditioning during the day for other things. The last thing you ever want to do is ever, ever, ever audition again. So it's, it's funny. It's, I feel like A Chorus Line is the best show in the world to do for three months. But if you're going to do more than three months, it starts to seep in your skin in not a good way. Does that sure. make sense? It makes perfect yeah. sense. It makes perfect That's sense. That's how I felt with that show. And I, and I guess Deirdre did too. I, didn't, I haven't spoken to her, but um, for sure it did for me. It affected me in that way. And, and that's, it's the only show I've ever, you know, every other show has not done that. But that one, There's it's too, it was too personal. It was too real. It was too um, at home. It was what I do, you know, every day. Right. And I think the only way to avoid that would be to not be good in the part. Because the only way to avoid those feelings would be to not put your heart into what you're doing and then you would be yes. terrible. You're so absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and in order for that part to work, which was also hard to do, was to give it your all every night, everything. Did you um, find yourself, uh, I, I know, I can just speak to my, personally, I, I know sometimes like a year into a run of a show, I start to get anxiety about the show more than I did when it opened. Did that ever happen for you on a show like Chorus Line where it got yes. harder yes. as it went on? Yes. Now, find, mind you, only a Chorus Line. I've not done that with any other show. And a Chorus Line, for the first time in my life, I had stage fright, which has never happened to me in my life. And it, and it was extremely horrible. And, it, and before, like, I would have to, Cassie, come back, right, at that moment, <laughs> I'd start to panic. And the white light would be on me and I literally couldn't sing. I could barely speak and I couldn't, and I'd start to sing and I'd be like, I can't sing, I can't sing. And I'd sing off pitch and I'd sing, I freaked out. And I, it was really weird, never in my life. And that's the, and I remember hearing about people having stage fright. And I was like, what the hell? And I couldn't get, I didn't get over it. It was after we opened the show. And then, you know, it was really bad. It was really bad. I was horrible too. And then finally I just went, I got to talk about it. So I started to talk about it with all my, just people like, oh my God, I fucking suck. I don't know what I'm doing. I have stage fright. I have this and that. And then the talking about it somehow relieved it. And, and then it came back again and then I was okay. But it was weird. So I've many, never... but so many of the greatest performers talk about it. I know like- yeah. Barbara Streisand has like very vocally talked about how she just like gets full it's on anxiety. It, it doesn't, it has nothing to do with being an amateur. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know what it is. And it's feel, it's, it's the feeling of, to me, especially with that, with all these people watching me and a spotlight on me and, and I, I don't know, it's like something you just get smaller and you just don't want, you, you can't do anything. And also I think it has to do with doing a long run. Probably Barbara Streisand too. It's her, she sang the songs a million times. Do you know what I mean? And so your, your focus is somewhere else that's not in the song, you know? It's weird, I don't know. I, very I know. But you're not the only person I've talked to that talks about this. I think it's more common yeah. than you think. I think, because these are things that we don't talk about on playbill.com. You know, yeah. that when you, that you walk out on stage and felt like you were terrible. Like, nobody wants to hear that on Broadway World, but that's why we want to talk about it on this show. Um, ah. you, you know, uh, speaking of anxiety, I was reading on Wikipedia, and I, you have to correct me if this is incorrect, but it says on Wikipedia that you have performed the role of Roxy Hart in Chicago at some point every, every year since 2001. Is that true? Um, I'm, I don't know about every year. That's not true, actually, because uh, I've done other shows. Like Chorus Line, I did for two years. Contact, I did right. for two years. Uh, Pippin, I did for two years. So those are two years I didn't do the show. But other than that, yes. I mean, I'd come back for like six weeks here, two months here, this and that, for 20 years almost now. Is that right? Yeah, almost 20 years. So it was a role I started when I was 31 years old and now I'm 56. So we're talking about a range in that part of yeah. age. And when I was 31, I looked 25, you know? So it's, it's amazing how that part, 
you can, I was thinking like, what role can you be 25 and also be 60 and play? You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. You can and do you it. Can with that you, role. you can. I, what, so what do you do <clears throat> to find inspiration to keep that, that, keep that part yeah. fresh? Now that role's easy for me to keep fresh. Unlike uh, Cassie, because she's funny and she is complicated. It's not, a, it's not like a typical musical theater role. She's, and also Walter Bobby allowed me so much, the director allowed me so much freedom with that role and trust my choices. And I, I feel like I have a framework and then in that framework I can play. So I just can play with it still. And I can come back a few years later and, and I, she's a little different and a little more mature and I play it differently and I'm allowed to. It's awesome. And she's complicated. Rock, I would never, Velma's less, she's, Velma's more straight. Her lines are really clear. Roxy's are much more complicated with a lot more colors. So I find it really much more fun to play. I think you might be, cover, be covering the mic on your phone. Just be careful. Totally am covering it. There you go. Totally there you go. We, we still, so anyway, I, still I was heard saying, you. did you hear me that Velma- we, we, I heard every cool. word, but it was just getting muffled, yeah. Yeah. Much have more you, black and you, white. Have you played Velma? No desire. <laughs> One, because of the black and white, but also I don't think I'd be that good in it, even though initially they wanted me for Velma, and I, 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 they wanted me to come in for Velma, they wouldn't see me for Roxy. And then I just bullshitted and came in with all Roxy stuff and pretended I didn't have any of the Velma stuff. Like I had no idea that they wanted me for Velma because I just knew that Roxy was the part for me. You know, people, Velma, have tried, people have tried that before to less success than you did it. Just yeah, because, <laughs> like that, 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 that like act, young actors listen at home. Charlotte made that work. Not everybody did. But I do have to say this, if you feel strongly about it, go for it. Don't, um, totally. don't not go for it. Don't go, not go for it. And if you fail, you fail, but it's better than, I just knew with Velma, I, I thought I, I, I could do it. I could play it. I could dance it. I could sing it. And I know how to act it. Um, but they're just people that are Velma that just walk in a room and are like, Hey, I'm sure. Velma and fuck you. And I, you know what I mean? They don't have to do anything. So I knew that I'd be acting at it and I just didn't, I, I just want to know that, you know, so that's, that's why. And also the reason why I don't want to do Velma is because I've done it Roxy so many times that I sat and watched that number. Can't do it alone. So many times that she does that it feels like I'd be doing it for the thousandth time. There's, it, it, you know what I mean? I'm already sick of it. Like, so right. sick of it. <laughs> Not to mention, you'd probably be doing the lines of the other character while you were on stage well, at that point. I yeah. mean, after this long. So I want to talk about um, uh, Carrie the Musical. And I want to be, be really clear up front. I am not yeah. here today to make fun of or to mock Carrie the Musical. Because I know... It's sort Doesn't of fit. No, I, well, I know, but that, but it's it's sort of this famous. It's it's a famous flop, almost like it is almost synonymous with one of the all-time great flops. So I watched, however, the opening number, which is on YouTube, and yeah. I just here's what here's what I started thinking about this when I watched it. At first, when I heard Carrie the musical, you're always like, oh my god, what? But then, the instinct to musicalize Carrie, which is about isolation and parent-child conflicts, religion, and has amazing characters in it. The, the characters are so well-drawn. The instinct to theatricalize it, I don't think was a truly stupid one right off the bat, because in a lot of ways, it has what would really make something good on stage. But then I went and watched the opening number, and after all I just said about religion and isolation and parent-child conflict, it opens with a jazzercise aerobics workout that is it is one of the most astonishing things i've ever seen mostly i'm wondering how much crystal meth was anyone in that number on to get through that do you remember do you remember doing that yes yes and i i don't know in the in i don't know which youtube you saw but um all of them. But. There's a whole solo I do. And then I do these, um, that like in the one that they show, you don't see my solo, you just see me doing walkovers. 
but um, then there's another solo. But anyway, I do that whole number and then I do a solo and then I do like 15 walkovers after that and then finish it. I, I, it was insane. It was insane. And I do remember thinking when the show closed, which mind you, we did two weeks, two weeks. And that's including opening and closing. I remember being relieved. I remember thought, oh, thank God, I don't have to keep this up because this is hell. And I remember during that time auditioning for Jerome Robbins Broadway while we were in that show. And I remember they asked me to sing at the audition and I said, I can't sing because I have no voice and I got to, like, I had to take care of so many parts of my body. Everything was like impossible because you're belting that whole number in, out. I mean, singing on the top of your lungs and on the floor, on the stand. Blah, 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 blah. It was crazy. The, was show, crazy. the show obviously closed because they couldn't pay for the cast's drug addictions. I mean, it would, in order, I watched that and I said, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And also, <laughs> also Darlene Love, is that, that's who was the gym teacher, right? Yes. Just yes. belting her fucking balls off. Like yes. every, everybody in that number, I've never seen anyone give more than I saw in that number. And I just thought like, <laughs> it's so crazy because the, it was astonishing, but yet it, in some ways it was so, it was just like in the wrong place, if that makes sense. Like that number, yeah. need, that number needed to be one of the all time great numbers in musical theater, just not there. I've always thought like, it's like, it's like, like that, Mommy that Dearest. Was... It's like yeah. Mommy Dearest, like Faye Dunaway and Mommy Dearest is yes. giving an Oscar nominated or worthy performance, but somehow it's just in that movie, it ends up coming across as insane. And that's how I feel yeah. about that opening number. It was in the wrong place. Yeah, it is in the wrong place. And, and the whole show was that, like there were moments and then there were a lot of those numbers, not just that one. Not just that one, but I have to say Betty Buckley and Lindsay Hately's performance are the best performances I've, I've ever seen on the Broadway stage, literally to this day. And, and the show would have run if they had the money to support it just because of that. So, you know, the two weeks that we ran that hype, there was a reason because of those, those performances were crazy insane, it, brilliant. Did you know when you were in it that it was like, what, yes. you're, you're, you did? I knew it was bad, and yet but it's I knew not it was bad. also brilliant. Yeah, that's... I knew that there was a combo, but we had done it already in London, in Stratford, Connecticut. Before, I mean, Staff Stratford, London, in England, Stratford, England, and it had gotten panned, killed, and they moved, and so we were like, "Oh shit! Oh shit!" And then they moved it to Broadway, and they didn't change anything except. Uh, Barbara Cook to Betty Buckley. That was the change. Other than that, nothing changed. And I remember thinking, what are they thinking? Like, are we, and we were panned across the board. So I, I just knew we were going to be killed. But, you know, and then I also knew because it was a weird combination of when we would do the show, you would have screaming. I mean, the audience were on their feet screaming and then you would have booing in the middle of it, you know, and it was, it was so bizarre. And, and you just, it was because we were, it, it was that combination of kind of brilliance and then just laughable. laughable. No, one, no one boos anymore. That's weird. Like, did you see the end of that? Because we also don't, but we also, I've always thought we should bring back throwing fruit like they did in Shakespeare days. Like, yeah, when I you remember. Saw, when you saw something that you didn't like, you brought tomatoes. Yeah, like, tomatoes. Imagine, imagine that now. Like, I, I, a part of me is like, bring it back. At least, if I'm, if I'm doing a show, I don't want to hear, I would rather get pegged with uh, fruit than hear f tepid applause. Wouldn't you? Yeah. 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 I know. I, I, know. I think booing is better than like, Golf clapping. Um, yeah, I agree. What, what is your, uh, I know you, you have kids, I know, and you're, you have a husband. I, what, what, what is your proudest achievement that's not your children? I mean, or, or getting married. You, uh, like, that's not a personal thing. Like, what's your proudest artistic achievement? Oh, God. I, you know, I would say Roxy. Roxy in Chicago. Really? 
Well, only because I feel like I made that role myself. I, I mean, like I reinvented it in a different way in some ways. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, God, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would say that. I would say Roxy because I feel like I really, that's me and in all my colors and I've, I've been allowed to play with it and, and, and at times in my life be completely crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I, that's a, that's a good question. But are you, I mean, you're asking me my career, right? Is that, yeah, is that yeah. your, your greatest theatrical achievement? I would say Roxy. Amazing. You know, and, and I mean, I mean, I don't know. They could be other things too, but I didn't get a chance. Like Sweet Charity is definitely a role that I feel is mine. Do you know what I mean? I would have done that's that's a role, and yet I had to. I did it on Broadway, but I I was covering Christina Applegate, and it was her show. It was made on her, not me. So I had to jump into her sh again. Another example: jumping into someone else's show and not it being on me. Was that but hard? But to me, um. I was doing Roxy. Oh, actually, this is a good achievement. I was doing Roxy and Chicago at the same, uh, Sweet Charity and Chicago at the same time. So I was doing Roxy on Broadway. And then when they needed me over at Sweet Charity, I would go over there and do Sweet Charity. So I was doing two shows at the same time. I'd say that's and a that, pretty, I have that's to a, say, was a pretty good achievement. That's pretty and good. I would just grab my wig, put it on, and I would say, use the same wig. <laughs> is that true? Really? Oh yes. <laughs> I'd use the same wig. So insane. And, and I have to say, I don't even know how the hell I did it because I had like no rehearsals. I don't know how I did it. And, and Sweet Charity is a big role, but I, I don't know how. But did you that, ever, did you ever do I like, did. The, did you, I mean, that's amazing. Did you ever do like a matinee of Chicago and then Sweet yes. Charity? Yeah, Absolutely. That's, that's <laughs> matinee of Chicago, evening of Sweet Charity. Yeah, insane. That is truly insane. Yeah. And my last question is, um, in this, in this, we didn't, I, I, I'm so glad we didn't talk about COVID, actually. I mean, we didn't bring this up one yeah, time, did. and it was so great, because it reminded me for five seconds that there's life outside of it. But COVID, I'm kidding. Uh, do, what, what um, in these times, what, what inspires you right now? And like, what, what creative urges do you feel as an artist at this point in your career? Like, what, what are you kind of like, oh, I really want to do this. I really want this. Okay. Well, first of all, it's, it's really rough right now because my children are about to, they're both applying for colleges. So I'm sort of living, like I can't sort of be myself yet. I'm, and plus we just got a puppy. So I'm dealing yeah. with puppies, with children, and, and I have to make sure, I just I kind of, I want to be quiet, wish they were out of the house so that I can like focus on myself again, which is hard. But what I really want to do, honestly, is when I was young, when I was very young, I would take a lot of dance classes because I did know how to dance jazz. I was a ballet dancer and I needed to learn because I knew I wanted to be a Broadway person. So I just had to take class and study from different types of people. And I really, if I could just, I'm just fucking, anyway, I just, whatever. I want to, I really am passionate and the thought of studying with so many of these great artists that are out there teaching on Zoom, that are teaching like crazy hip hop stuff that I'm afraid to go into a dance. You know, I'm Charlotte Dumboise and for me to go into a dance class, it's kind of, I don't want anybody to know who I am. I want to hide in the back. But I, here, during Corona, I can zoom into everywhere and start to pick up new kind of styles of dance. And that's exciting to me. And then ultimately use that to teach, but not have people watching me like be really bad at it. Like if I were in a dance class going, oh, I'm going to take a hip hop class and suck. <laughs> but now I can learn in my own home. But that's kind of exciting to me. Um, but other than that, I don't, I just don't have time because of my kids, you know, it's. Do you ever see yourself, getting... do you ever see yourself being in a play with no yes, music I've and no dance? Yes, I've done plays. But would you do more of it? And I would, and I love doing plays. I love acting. To me, it's yeah. number one. Um, I love it more than anything and any, and dancing just to dance doesn't mean that much to me, except 
when I'm teaching. But um, I would love to do more of it. And I, and I love plays. The only thing I find with plays, I have to say, long runs with plays, not easy to do. Mm. It's much easier to do a musical, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because music helps it. Somehow the, doing a play for a long run is damn hard. It's hard. Well, I think you don't get the energy from live music that you that sort of propels you through it a little bit. You got yes, so you have violins and drums and things playing. You have things vibrating below they the help stage you. that help you for sure. When you're I walking out on stage, yeah. yeah it's, when you're it's walking hard. out on when you're walking out on death of a salesman, it's just you and the words. You don't get you don't get any help. I don't think. And you don't I think, get any help. I, I suspect that that's why. I mean, I think you really have to reinvestigate as a, as a straight play actor in a different way than you do as a music as yeah. a theater actor. Because but most straight plays, most straight plays don't last long. Like, I mean, sure. I mean, you know what I mean? I'm not going to be doing 20 years of, That's, you know, don't tell that to, desire. Don't tell that to Marion Seldes. She was in, <laughs> rest, what was she in? Rest in peace. She was in, she was in Death Trap for like, I don't know, like 10 years or something. Like she did the same fucking play. Really? I yeah. think Death Trap lasted that long? Oh yeah. I don't know if it was, t she did it 10 years, but it was something, it was really long. She did a straight play for years. And she was like one of the, you know, a really, really well-known and great state actors, but she did Death yes. Trap for like an eternity. I mean, she, rest in peace, she's passed away, not because of Death Trap, but I'm sure that that didn't help her longevity that she did the same play for 10 years. I mean, you'd have to- isn't that insane? But she had breaks, right? No. No? This was oh like- Oh, God, that's- this Okay, was, that's, this, that's insane. Right. That's come back. Come, stay on stage, Marion. Um, <laughs> uh, 